Excellent. We'll get started. My name is Tomo Nakahara. I run the uh, developer experience team at this company called Weaveworks. Uh, welcome. If this is your first time joining our weekly Weave online user group, then welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have here David Oranchik, who's our speaker today, uh, and Stacy, who's our community manager, who has put together this lovely series of um, weekly Weave online user groups. This is our final session of this season um, before we go on holiday, and so stay tuned. We'll be having more content, guest speakers, our own speakers on a variety of topics around Kubernetes and related areas, um, the topic maybe GitOps that you've heard of. Um, so we will share uh, at the end our meetup group, which is a great single source of truth if you want to stay tuned on future episodes. Uh, so thanks for coming. So today we're very lucky to have Dave Aronchik, who's head of open source ML strategy at Microsoft, um, he used to be over at Google running uh, Kubeflow, and he'll be talking about machine learning operations, or as we uh, shrink it, uh, ML ops, um, so that you can uh, bring ML ops to production. Uh, so before we get started, a little bit about us. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Stacy and I work for a company called Weaveworks. We're a startup based in uh, London, San Francisco, Colorado, New York, Berlin, with distributed teams. Um, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers are the people who created RabbitMQ as well as the company, and then sold it off to VMware. Uh, and then over time, they noticed uh, various needs in the container and increasing Kubernetes space. Uh, it started building open source projects that then led to our company, Weaveworks. Um, we are uh, funded by a couple, we're a VC funded company by a couple VCs uh, such as Excel Partners, um, but I also mentioned Google Ventures because it's definitely part of our um, long investment in the Kubernetes community. Um, if you've heard of us before, you might have been involved um, either in our open source projects um, or our products. Among our open source projects, um, WeaveNet has been around, I think, the longest, um, and it is definitely one of the premier projects that you would use to network your Kubernetes clusters. Um, we have some projects that have now moved into the CNCF. We have Cortex, which is in the CNCF, as well as Flux, which is our latest that joined as a sandbox project. Uh, Cortex builds upon and makes Prometheus scalable. Um, as well as other things. And uh, Flux is kind of the um, automated deployment tool that kind of led to this concept of GitOps that we coined and has kind of taken off. Um, we have many, many others more than this list, um, but one of our most recent ones that you might have heard of is Flagger, which helps you do things like canary deployments and blue-green, um, leveraging um, uh, service meshes such as Istio and Linkerd and others. Uh, we also have products. Um, our longest product is called Weave Cloud, which is a SaaS product that helps you do management, monitoring, and automated deployments uh, for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, in some ways, it has aspects of hosted Cortex, uh, Flux, and other projects that I mentioned um, with obviously an interface and more integrations so that you can do things like leverage Prometheus uh, metrics to do canary or blue-green deployments. And, um, so uh, you can check that out. It's a Weave Cloud. Uh, we've been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS for now four years. So we have experience running Kubernetes in production for that time. Uh, so a lot of our customers asked for help with those areas. So we have now productized um, the Kubernetes layer that we use to put Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. Um, so now that is a product that we have that you can do on-prem um, or uh, on a cloud. Um, and it's a very GitOps aware enterprise platform for production. Um, and with that, a lot of people do need some additional help. So we do offer some consulting training and support. So if you have any questions about that, you can certainly email me. You'll get an email after this event um, or check out our website, weave.works. So thanks for listening. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, these sessions usually last about 45 minutes. They can be as short as 30, um, generally they're about 45. If there's tons of burning questions after the talk, we will um, allow people to go over, but have an absolute hard deadline at 60 minutes. Uh, but generally, these tend to um, end at about 45 minutes. To ask your, your questions, you should ask them in the chat box. So make sure that you find that. If you don't see the button for the chat box, which is usually on the top left corner of your screen, uh, sometimes it helps to hit escape and that'll get you out of um, full screen mode and makes the Zoom, the Zoom dashboard capabilities a little bit more um, uh, visible. 
Uh, and then when you are chatting, please make sure that you chat to all panelists and attendees, because otherwise your questions or comments will only go to um, the panelists. And so especially if you're answering someone else's question, which often happens, um, they won't be able to see it. So make sure in your two drop down that you choose to all panelists and attendees. So thanks for that. That's the housekeeping. With that, I will hand it over to David. And let me know if I need to stop sharing my slides for you to take over. Uh, yes, please uh, stop okay. sharing. I will stop sharing. <clears throat> okay, uh, can everyone see this? <clears throat> yes, we can. Thanks. All right. Um, well, thank you so much uh, to Weave for the opportunity to come and uh, talk about this, um, you know, uh, the promise of ML ops. Um, you know, for, first, uh, my housekeeping, um, I, I really love answering folks' questions. So um, please do, um, you know, uh, ask away. Uh, it's a much more interesting talk when I'm able to make it relevant for the folks that are on here. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, let's just get it underway. <coughs> um, and you're seeing the the presentation mode of this, correct? Uh, meaning you don't see like uh, um, uh, yes, just the slides. Yeah, just the slides. Not yes. you're not seeing any of the PowerPoint stuff. So. Okay, your your emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have nothing interesting to say in my emails, so uh, that would not be not be a big leak. Um, okay, so. Uh, I am David Ronchek. I um, uh, work at Azure on uh, open source machine learning. Um, previously, I uh, was uh, the lead product manager on Kubernetes and I started the Kubeflow project. Uh, and I joined Azure uh, just about a year ago. And, you know, for a lot of folks, though Azure, um, you know, and Microsoft doesn't historically have, um, you know, the, as big a name as some of the other players in ML. Uh, it's actually interwoven into just about every bit of, of Microsoft as a whole. Um, and, and one of the things that we do and really pride ourselves on is not just having the latest model or having, you know, the fastest chip or anything like that, though we certainly do. Uh, it's, it's about offering a platform for machine learning that works across all the disciplines of machine learning. And so that whether or not that's your data, we, we work really hard to have, uh, you know, rich data services, uh, both on-prem and in the cloud. Um, we offer the unlimited scale that the cloud offers. And then of course, many models um, that, that not just we have, but we also open source um, and, and make available to everyone. And I'll get to some of these in just a second. Um, like I said, um, you know, machine learning, uh, it, you know, we, we care very, very deeply about the machine learning community, not just for what we use internally, but we also give a bunch back to the research community. Uh, you can see some of the advancements that we have released is research papers recently. Um, in 2016, we, we were able to help achieve 96% on uh, ResNet. Uh, that's a 96% uh, to, uh, you know, accuracy, better than human uh, or, or human at human parity. Uh, same on speech recognition in uh, 2017, and then machine translation and reading comprehension. We've done a ton of work relative to uh, NLP, natural language processing. Uh, and of course, all given that back as well. Uh, and the reason isn't just because we want to help the community, of course we do, but the reason is also that, that machine learning touches just about every one of the areas of our business. Um, you know, in Windows, in, in uh, Skype, in, in our search engine with Bing, um, Office 365, of course, Microsoft Research and, and Xbox. Every one of these businesses is richer because we have machine learning included. And in many ways, we couldn't even operate these businesses if we didn't have machine learning. Uh, you know, over 180 million active users in Office 365 use AI today. Um, 18 billion questions asked of Cortana. And every day we, we analyze 6.5 trillion uh, you know, security events in Windows um, worldwide. Uh, the, these numbers are so large and the, the permutations on what's going on is so big that there's simply no way that we could attack these problems with this amount of data if we didn't have very, very sophisticated machine learning. And, and that's machine learning that we use internally, but also um, release externally. So uh, this, is where, this is the point where, 
you know, as a uh, company that is doing a lot of machine learning and, and releasing it to the world, uh, we kind of do a disservice to everyone else because the first thing we do is we, you know, say all these great things and then people are like, well, but it's really hard. And it is, it is really hard to do ML. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of reasons that I'll get into here. Uh, but most of all, it's that, you know, we have these like incredible answers for everyone and then we kind of leave them abandoned. Um, you know, not really sure how to, um, uh, you know, approach going after this. But one of the biggest reasons that it's so hard is what you see here. Um, uh, you, uh, you know, we talk about all these like great breakthroughs, but, but building a model is not the end all be all of machine learning. In fact, it is usually just one small step in machine learning from ingestion to transformation, validation, uh, training your model, uh, mo validating the model, making sure it actually works, works on production data, data, rolling it out, serving it, and then of course monitoring and logging it and bringing those monitors and lo you know logs back into your data so that you can be smarter overall. So, uh, but you're a data scientist, uh, you don't care. You all you really do want to focus on is building that model. Um, but the reality is you do care. Uh, because if you don't focus on how to bring your model to production, then your model is effectively worthless. Sure, it works great on your laptop, but what good is that? And this is a great story that, that we like to quote often. Um, you know, at, at uh, Strata, uh, this a person from IBM talked about how, you know, they built a very, very sophisticated model in just three weeks, but over 11 months later, the thing still wasn't deployed. And that's because of this isolation between where the model is being built and bringing it to production. And, and this isolation looks like this. The data scientist is over here on the left-hand side. She wants to do quick iteration. She wants to uh, use a framework that she understands. Maybe it's the latest framework that has some you know, brand new uh, estimator in it or, or who knows what. Um, she may wanna use any kind of tools that are available to her in order to get to the you know, highest quality model. And of course she wants unlimited scale. On the other side of the coin, you have the SRE and the ML engineer who you know, have almost the exact opposite needs. They have concerns for cost. They have concerns for how to obey the corporate compliance of libraries and, and tooling and things like that. They can't offer just any application uh, in production. Uh, and they of course have big uptime concerns. But we can bring them together. Uh, and the way we're gonna do this is through a story we've heard before. Now, uh, obviously this is a, ML, or this is a GitOps talk. Um, and uh, you know, the, the story to date uh, is really been about GitOps, where you take your, uh, you know, when it comes to application development, you take Git and you drive all your workloads via that. You start with Git, it obviously goes into dev, and then it pushes into ops. Um, and what that provides when you do that is this wonderful cyclical cycle, where on the left-hand side, the developer is very, very quick. They're able to iterate quickly. Uh, and then when they're ready to move on, they check that into a centralized repository, and then that kicks off an entire set of automation. And that automation provides all of those enterprise features, or if your things do not support that enterprise, it automatically blocks them, which is uh, again, the appropriate step. So you get both velocity and security. So what we need to do is do the same thing with, but with machine learning. And this is the practice coming up right now called ML ops. So to reiterate what this looks like, it looks very similar to GitOps, which is certainly the point. On the left-hand side, you have that data scientist who is experimenting on her laptop or in her private cluster. She's iterating very quickly. She understands the business. She understands how to acquire the data and so on. And she develops. And then once she's finished developing the model, she checks it into the same Git that anyone else does and has a repository that is able to pick it up and, and move that model into production in a much more aggressive way. Um, and that, that kind of movement um, now integrates, instead of that, that data scientist being alone on her own island, she is part of the software engineering practice and you can start reusing a whole bunch of good stuff, such as you know, testing, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and so on. Uh, okay, 
Uh, and the benefits there are, you know, very similar to what you see normally when it comes to benefits around GitHub. Uh, you get, you know, automated automation and observation. Uh, you get reproducibility because everything has been checked in and verifiable. The pipelines are valid, uh, checked in. You can validate things. Uh, that artifact is there. The pipeline is there. You can confirm quality, you know, both offline and online. You can, it, it improves your ability to do uh, explanation. And then of course, reproducibility and audibility, where you, because everything is being driven through this common pipeline, you're able to do a lot more and get, you know, all kinds of great comparisons. So you, at the end of the day, you get velocity and security for ML. Um, before I move on, any, any questions so far? We've covered a lot of it. And now we're going to start to get into some of the nitty gritty. Any details? We haven't gotten any so far. Yeah, I don't see any. OK. Yeah. So at, at, uh, if you're at a big company, um, you typically use the existing platform that they already provide. And there's often very, very large teams that are, whose singular goal is to support these. Uh, in, at Google, it's, it's uh, through TFX. Uh, at FB Learner, there's FB Learner, or Facebook, there's FB Learner Flow. Uber has Michelangelo. Microsoft has Ether. Lots of different folks out there. They're hosted services, and they're designed to make sharing and building and, and reproducibility you know, first class. Now, if you are an ML engineer or a data scientist and don't want to go work at a big company, uh, you can build your own. And uh, all the tools are available for you. Uh, you start with a something on the left hand side. Uh, you know, you could use something like Kubeflow, which is all these pipelines built in. Uh, I, I work at Azure and you can certainly use Azure Machine Learning. Uh, other clouds also have their own platforms uh, that you can piece together. Uh, and you want to look for ones that are microservice oriented, where you're able to pick and choose a single feature via an API and use it uh, because that'll make your pipeline overall much easier. You take that and you integrate a source uh, you know, a control repository. It could be GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, anything that allows for rich eventing, just like you would with GitOps. And then you add in on top of that uh, your CI-CD platform, Jenkins, Azure DevOps, uh, you know, Weave Flux, of course, uh, GitHub Actions, and so on. And there are many, many uh, platforms here. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> I do say often, uh, if you have need of a particular CI CD solution, there's certainly something out there. Please don't go out and write a new one um, uh, because there are many, many of them. Uh, we got a question. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the difference between a data scientist and an ML engineer? You know, a lot of these, these roles are not as clean as you would think. A data scientist typically will be focused on the architecture of the model itself. Uh, or the inbound data or anything like that. So really working and focusing on, um, uh, you know, outliers and areas under the, under the curve and so on. Um, uh, outside of that, a machine learning engineer typically is about taking that, that code that describes that, um, that model and moving it into a production level training or inference environment. So they'll take that, um, uh, they'll take that, that inbound a, uh, model and, and wrap it in, in a container and, and have it with observability and, uh, you know, adapt it to their scale out solution and things like that. But it is, you know, th these are pretty subtle points. Oftentimes, uh, in great organizations, a data scientist will do both or an SRE will come help. Um, you know, the, the lines aren't that clear. What you need, though, is someone that does every one of these sets, uh, steps in the function. Um, we have another question. Got another question around uh, GitOps, give it ops, uh, emphasis on observation. In the ML world, what kind of metrics do we capture and observe? Uh, we will cover a bit of this later, um, but you know, really think about it in the exact same way that you think about your application today. Uh, you know, what, you know, from basic things like error rates and RAM and CPU and leakage and all that kind of stuff, all the way up to how well things are performing when you move it into production. Uh, when you move that model out there, uh, are you actually getting the results you wanted? Um, you know, what are the inbound logs? What are the results that you got uh, when you were having this in production? How does production data result in production answers? All those kind of things. Um, 
you you want to bring you know you bring up such a good point here because bringing all that information back into your training pipeline is key uh and you know one thing that that um ml ops and machine learning has that is very different than uh you know a lot of standard applications is that continuous data that you're going to be getting back uh, is not just used to kind of like prevent errors, but it's actually, you know, critical to not having your model drift uh, and, and start to give bad results as, as your production data changes. But also, it will make your model much richer and much more accurate because you're just going to continue to add more, uh, in, you know, observations on top of it. So uh, both good questions. Um, I'm going to take off my uh, Microsoft or my uh, uh, cloud neutral hat for just a moment to talk about something specific uh, as it relates to Azure. Uh, this is not specifically Azure, but these are a set of functions that you're really going to need. And we're, I'll, I'll talk to you about how they, they fold in to your MLOps pipeline in just a minute. Um, when you look at something like a multi-cloud deployment, um, you know, ML is particularly well suited for what we would consider to be multi-cloud. Now that isn't a single application spanning these environments. There are two different environments that you have for very specific reasons. So a very, uh, very often you'll see something like we have a whole bunch of data sitting in one location. Could be on-prem, could be on my laptop, could be in cloud number one. And we just wanna do a bunch of processing and training around that next to the data. And so what you'll do is you'll, you'll have your GitOps pipeline. It'll start over here with Git and then it'll kick off and do a bunch of work here until it gets to a point where it's finished and it has a trained model ready to go. And you'll submit that to something like a model registry or an S3 bucket or anything you'd like. And then from that point, you'll move forward and maybe that's in a second environment where you're doing staging um, and then finally moving it off to serving. But these kind of very loosely coupled steps are critical to a rich and flexible ML ops pipeline. Um, the way that we handle this with Azure is what you see here. Um, we offer a, a very rich tool called Azure DevOps, um, which does a whole bunch of different CI CD solutions. You saw all the CI CD solutions earlier and you can use any one of them, but you'll want something that is very, very neutral. It supports any cloud, any language, arbitrary REST endpoints, um, uh, YAML, Slack, you know, all, all kinds of things. And most importantly, you know, containers and Kubernetes, which, you know, really is becoming the most popular way to run a lot of these different platforms. Uh, from that, we offer on Azure a, a hosted training environment where Azure DevOps can kick off a training of your model to, um, uh, or, or potentially inference. Uh, and you want to have a CI CD solution that understands these as native tasks. So, you know, don't, you, you don't, it's very easy to adapt a arbitrary CI CD pipeline to support your ML ops requirements. But if you can already get one that, that has all those adapters built in, uh, it's gonna save you a whole bunch of time. Uh, quick question, how do you uh, deal with production versus staging environments when you need PII for model features? And the security uh, team says you can't have staging in or PII in staging. Um, well, you know, this, this is a good example where you really should have a set of, um, uh, you know, sta staging is not designed for, or, or even training really, is, is not designed for, you know, using PII if you can avoid it. Uh, uh, in both, you know, the test validation environment as well as in the staging environment, the more that you can get to artificial and re reproducible um, data, that has been, you know, either anonymized or um, uh, scanned in some way, uh, or or just purely synthetic. Uh, that's going to be a much stronger thing because in both of those environments, you're going to want absolutely reproducible data. You're not going to want to continually feed in uh, new data from production. Um, you'll want to continually, you know, run against this synthetic data that is not generated on the fly, that is generated once, but is designed to exercise every element of your system um, so that you can ensure that things work properly. So my recommendation for you is to, in fact, create a synthetic data set. Again, and you can do that via either 
you know, one-way hashing, anonymization of, of all the PII in that in in your data, or you can you know create it purely synthetically. But again, the most important part is not to have enormous data sets; it's to uh, really stretch all the elements of your system. Good question. Um, you know, additional features that you're really going to want uh, in your CI/CD system: model versioning and storage. Where did this come from? How you know what was the previous model? How has this model changed over time? Uh, did you do any conversion like quantization or things like that? Uh, model validation. This is something that a lot of people really overlook, and you're like, well, look, the model worked, and so on. But you know, what kind of RAM do you really need for this? What kind of CPU does the thing crash loop? That stuff happens all the time, and people really underestimate uh, you know the quality of the model as you roll it out. Uh, additionally, model profiling, um, you know, this is a service that, that uh, we offer at Microsoft, and again, it's all cloud neutral, so you could take any arbitrary model you want, you know, sign up for our service, hand us the model, and we'll develop a profile for you to say, oh, um, you know, this model starts to hit your latency requirements at 2.5 gigabytes of RAM, and you know hits your res uh, response time requirements when it gets to whatever three cores, uh, and this kind of graph now gives you the visibility into you know really saving cost but still meeting your production needs. And then finally, model deployment, rolling it out to production, getting yourself a REST endpoint, making sure that deployment subscribes to your overall security uh, criteria uh, and integrates with your app well. So those are all, uh, now taking my Azure back, hat back off, those are all services we do offer on Azure, but, but any cloud out there that, that is you know, offering ML in a first class way should offer that as well. Uh, and those really are things you don't want to go and build and manage yourself. Uh, they are quite complicated and um, you know, a first class cloud will offer you uh, those clean endpoints to check those in and store them and, and use them. Uh, without having to consume an entire ML ops pipeline. So a lot of people say, well, geez, you know, those are a lot of steps. It seems like a lot of work. You know, that's, that is a lot of work, but, but this is even more work, right? 11 months uh, without the thing in production, that's, that's a disaster. Uh, the ML ops truly gets you to production by giving the, your data scientist that end-to-end -end, um, uh, ownership and giving her the ability to execute like a SWE. Uh, think about how many tools your software engineers have today that, um, you know, a, a data scientist just doesn't even have available to her. Uh, you know, the, we've spent 30 plus years making data science, or uh, developers great. We need to do the same with um, software or data scientists, and MLOps is a great first step there. It also allows you to do continuous delivery of uh, value, which is obviously critical, uh, and give you a lot of lineage and auditability uh, which you'll need over time. And I'll give you some examples about how uh, this all impacts in a second. Okay, so um, why? Uh, let's dive into some real world examples that we've seen. Uh, but first let's uh, answer uh, the question here. Going back to the staging environment versus production environment. Uh, so a scenario where building a model takes 10 hours to build and I do that in the dev environment. I'm happy with the model in the developer environment. Isn't it a waste of resources to, product, uh, to do the same work using CICD to replicate the efforts in the final production environment. Uh, no, you're not, so you're not reproducing uh, the training. Um, you're reproducing, you're, you're doing it in a repeatable way. And, and look, the reality is, is that um, if your, your dev environment is not the place you wanna be doing this. Uh, dev environments change very, very quickly. They are uh, not tracked, they're not audited. Uh, they often have very low security requirements, um, you know, on and on and on. Uh, in fact, the, the, the waste of time, I would argue, is the 10 models in your 10 hours you spent in your dev environment. What you really should be doing is spending, you know, 10 minutes in your dev environment, making sure that the model is converging, that it's uh, working appropriately, that the, the result of that model uh, does in fact begin to converge to what you need it to, and then take that code and check it in to your overall uh, training environment and then go from there. Uh, question about ML flow and Azure ML ops. ML flow is uh, just an experimentation uh, tool. It is not um, uh, designed for um, ML ops in, in any way. Um, 
It is uh, designed for, uh, it's a wonderful experience for tracking your experiments. Um, but uh, you, what you want to use is something like uh, Kubeflow or ML, uh, you know, Azure DevOps or, you know, any of the other cloud uh, solutions for building an end-to-end -end ML pipeline. Um, uh, you know, not taking anything away from the experience that you, you get from MLflow, it's wonderful, uh, but it is just one small step. You know, remember that box that I showed at the beginning? Just think of it as kind of like uh, building a model versus uh, everything else out there. Um, let's see, so I think I answered all the questions there. Oh, did you get the follow-up from Jad? Uh, he says, if, if I do suggest, uh, do the suggested solution. Oh, suggested solution. Don't you use model lineage? Uh, um, yes. Uh, uh, if you do the suggested solution, you will not. And I will show you exactly how you do that. OK? Looks good. So what do you do all this stuff for? So first, does my model actually work? Uh, and this is exactly to the dev experience that, that we were just talking about. You have your data scientist over here. She has a very powerful laptop or developer environment. And she says, she runs it and uh, boy, that tensor board model looks great. Uh, everything going to the right, loss is great, accuracy is great, so on and so forth. Time to go to production. She takes it and she sends it over to production and uh, you know, bad times happen. And, and the reason bad times happen is many. Uh, so the, the SRE says, uh, you know, no, no to that. We're gonna use Git to do this. And so the, uh, she, the uh, SRE says no. Uh, instead, we're going to do it to source control, uh, and, except, unfortunately, the exact same bad things happen. And the SRE is like, wait, I don't understand. We're using Git. This is good. Uh, nope. No, it's actually not. Um, a small example of some, the, the issues that you can have when rolling things out to production is here. Um, and boy, you know, these are all experiences that I have either personally had, or you see the people whose names are in blue. I, I solicited suggestions from the, uh, from the Twitterverse and they added them. If you have your own and would like to appear on the slide in the future, please send them to me. But, but honestly, inappropriate hardware stacks, data versioning model, um, uh, incorrect coded heuristics, your production data you know, has a different schema than your private one, things crash loop, uh, AB testing worked improperly, so on and so forth. Now you're never gonna make, get, get all these errors to zero, um, but uh, you can help make it much better. And the way you do that is through MLOps. So you take the data scientist, she's worked on it on her local laptop, it looks good. It passes sanity check, it passes syntax checking, so on and so forth. And she checks it into source control. And from that point, you kick off a standard ML pipeline where you clean and minimize the code, you validate it, you profile it, make sure it all works properly, look for bias, um, you package it for rollout in a production ready way, attach your security components and so on, and then you have a sane deployment. And that sane deployment rolls out to the cloud in the exact same way before, but it's gone through all of these steps first. And that's critical, uh, because at the end now, you know that it, that it works in these following ways. Again, doesn't remove all of the pain that you had earlier. Uh, certainly there will be errors that uh, can come through, but you're minimizing the likelihood that those things show up. And you may say, I can do all these things manually, but no, you can't. Um, even if every data scientist is trained and you had all the tools necessary and they all work together and your SREs understood ML and modeling and, 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 you'd still need a permanent and repeatable record. And this is exactly what, um, uh, I believe it's uh, 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 Jal, or Jad, excuse me, was saying earlier, um, you need that lineage. You need uh, storage of all this information and, and driving things through a process rather than a series of manual check boxes and recipes. That's what MLOps is designed to provide you. Okay, so now our MLOps, uh, our model is actually working. Um, good times, uh, we're all set. But what did our customers actually see? So um, let's take a very trivial example here. You have your SRE who has gotten a great model and she has a very simple website, a front end with a model server uh, behind it. Uh, and a customer comes along and says, I'd like a loan. And the front end says, no. Um, and the customer says, um, well, uh, why? And uh, everyone's uh, unhappy. Uh, because the lawyers have descended. Um, 
and and the problem here is that exactly like you said unless you record all of this information about how you train the model and what data it came from and and what that specific customer was actually served you're opening yourself up to bias and legal liability and so on uh, and I just give a couple examples here. You know, how do you exclude outliers? What are your model statistics? Uh, particularly as it relates to protected classes, gender, sexual orientation, uh, race, religion, so on. Um, what did the model actually serve to this specific person? Um, and, and how was that model, you know, which model was chosen? And ML ops can help. And the way you do that, and again, is via these standard source control and GitOps techniques. You start with your pipeline that we have earlier, and at the end, instead, when you roll it out, you move it to your model server, except in this case, first, you apply a signature to every step of that specific code that you have chosen and the deployment that you rolled out to your model server. And then you, deploy, you, you apply a signature or you develop a hash for the entire pipeline as a unified whole. So each element is hashed, but then it, the entire pipeline is hashed as a whole. And you move that, all this data into a mutable data store. So now when that customer comes along and says, why didn't I get a loan? You can say, well, it was this particular pipeline that we developed for you. And as a result, we can say that we have done all this by anti-bias, anti-training and so on and so forth. And the reason you were able to do this and you, you can use some of the explainability toolkits to get there. Okay, so again, this isn't, changing anything about your model necessarily, but it is giving you an absolutely clean artifact about how why this person got this particular result. Okay, so now we, we have a model out there and it's, it's running in production and that's all good, but is my model still good? And this is a really interesting problem which happens much more in machine learning than it does in a standard data science, or excuse me, standard developer uh, development today. The way this works is the following. First, uh, we're going to give you a very, very trivial example. Here we have a barn. Inside this barn, there is a blue duck or an orange duck. What color is that duck? So let's use machine learning. Machine learning is the best. Why wouldn't we use machine learning? We're going to develop a model. The model is going to have a signature. This is all good. We're doing the right thing. Uh, and the model says it's a blue duck. And you're like, well, great. It's a blue duck. Um, but wait. Let's say there are 995 yellow ducks in the population and just five blue ducks. Well, that, that seems skewed, but it can't be that wrong, can it? Uh, because we've already tested. We know our model has 99% accuracy and the false positive rate is just 1%. So 99 times out of 100, this should be right, right? Uh, no. Uh, I, for those of you that aren't stati statisticians, uh, this is uh, Thomas Bayes, uh, who you may have heard of because all these uh, Bayesian recommendations and, and so on uh, are based on his work. In fact, the, the thing that we're going to talk about right now is Bayes' theorem. Uh, they always say never put an equation in your talk uh, because everyone drops off. But I'm noticing on the Zoom right now that nobody has dropped off, so I'm going to consider this a, a success. And the net of what this is going on here is that the accuracy depends on the population distribution. So now my model server, for the sake of argument, was trained to, based on the idea that this was a 50-50 split, that there were the same number of yellow ducks as, orange, as blue ducks. Um, but the population is actually different. It is far higher and more skewed towards uh, yellow ducks than it is blue ducks. So what is the accuracy here? It is wrong two thirds of the time. And you can see there is in fact a yellow duck behind the scenes. Um, and that this purely comes from the fact that I trained my model incorrectly. I trained it with the wrong uh, bias towards the population. And this is again, something that you just need to pay attention to that, that you need to understand as you go through your work. And you might say, who cares? Well, who cares is all of us, right? Um, facial recognition stuff is all over the place. The incidence of crime in the population is very, very, very low. Like, despite what you see on the local news, there are not a lot of crimes happening. And there are a lot of people. In the US, there are whatever, 330 million people. And we don't have 330 million criminals. We have 
whatever, three million people in, in prison today. It's very small. And so you get these terrible results like this. <laughs> no, I've been there. Um, I do love South London. Um, but even there, I can guarantee I, your crime rate is, is much lower than this. And what happens is, is you get these things where if you train these models based on the, the idea that there are many, many people working on, you know, in, in the population that are criminals, but in fact there are not, what you get is terrible results like you see here. Uh, we have a question. Um, uh, git commit hash for the pipeline. Okay, we'll, we'll cover that at the end. Uh, actually, we can do it now. So um, how do you go about working on different feature back in the model build step before proceeding to evaluating the model validation? How does collaboration work on a repo level? Well, what you want to do is um, drive all of your actions via Git because then you get SHAs for free. So uh, let's say you were doing a transformation of your data and stripping whatever, you know, nulls that, um, or whatever, uh, no, you know, there were temperature numbers that were coming in at more than, you know, a thousand degrees. Well, that's, that's crazy. Obviously, um, uh, that would never happen in the real world unless you were in a blast furnace. Uh, so you're just going to strip those. Those are obviously bad results. You, what you do is you don't go into the data directly. You go into your data pipeline and you check that code in uh, to say, I want to exclude data that is, you know, outside of these normal schema. Um, and then the, the Git, the code for that transformation is the place that ends up having the collaboration. Now you don't have to do that when you're iterating on your local laptop, though the extent to which you can do that via code, you'll be better when it comes to moving to production. But, you know, oftentimes that's a little bit slower than, than you would like. So um, that's a pretty effective way to do it. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. okay. Yes. All right. So um, uh, not everyone's a criminal. Uh, and the worst is, is it not everyone's a criminal, but it's also hard to opt out of this stuff, right? Uh, so this is hitting all of us all the time right now. And it's our responsibility to, um, you know, number one, speak up. We're all technologists. If you see people, you know, just absolutely abusing statistics and facial recognition like the, this Amazon fa facial recognition was doing, uh, it's up to us to speak up. Uh, but second, it's up to us to be better about our data science. Uh, and you can address it, right? So now, let's say you push out a model that understands, you know, the, the distribution of the population. You're going to be better. It doesn't mean you're not going to abuse statistics, but you're going to be better. And now when it's a blue duck, you're more confident it's a blue duck. But again, this is where ML ops comes. The problem is, let's say your population changes, which happens all the time. Maybe yesterday, uh, it was the day before Christmas, and so... Uh, your job was to re recommend things that are, you know, sales, uh, and now you don't have any sales, but you're still recommending them. That is something that happens over a 24-hour period, um, and that's why it's up to you to build very reliable pipelines that you can run through over and over again. They can go stale very quickly, so you want to watch your model and your data for drift from training, um, and you want to regularly train. I would argue that if your model is uh, been untrained for more than even a week, uh, your, your systems and your architecture needs help. Um, that's how quickly things go, go south. And, and in situations where you're particularly doing online stuff, uh, like the, the example I gave earlier around sales or you know, um, uh, productions or recommendations or things like that, you're going to want to training much more quickly than that, hourly, you know, um, every 10 minutes if you can. Uh, it doesn't have to be from scratch. It can be, you know, just aug continually augmenting new data, doing transfer learning and things like that. Um, but you really need to have a pipeline that, that works and works end to end. Um, you know, w without that, you're, you're going to run into a lot of challenges. So that's the broad strokes. I hope I've made a convincing case for why ML ops is so important. And, and really, it is the core of any ML system, even more than your model, having these automated tools are absolutely critical. Uh, and it does, it gives you, you know, software best practices for machine learning, uh, gives you that repeatable workflow with lineage and tracking and auditing, uh, gives you an immutable record that you're going to want. Uh, and then of course, uh, lineage and, uh, at, you know, acceleration to customer benefits. So it does, you know, it, nothing's for free. It's going to require some human work. It's going to require some training. Uh, and in particular, the more that you um, uh, the more of these features you pick up, 
you're really probably going to have to do some retraining of your data scientists to move, move but uh, you can you know, get the, a lot of benefits over time. Uh, question from Raphael, if my training processes are triggered from Git, how does auto retrain work? Would it continuously commit to Git? Um, in that case, what you want to do is um, uh, you, you would have separate systems. So you'd have an MLOps pipeline, but then you'd potentially have a, a system of record that did, um, you know, when a, a model was kicked off or when, it, when a training was kicked off, so on and so forth. Um, and in that, you absolutely would. Every time you had kicked off a new pipeline, you would record that you had kicked it off. Uh, potentially using Git or any other, uh, you know, immutable metadata resource uh, and say, I kicked this off and this is the thing I did. The, the pipeline wouldn't necessarily change, but the data you were using to train on it probably would. Um, There's another you, question before from around. Yeah, uh, canary deployments. Uh, when this, yes, absolutely. You should absolutely do canary deployments as well. Uh, that is actually kind of separate. Um, uh, you know, I, cr canary deployments are critical. Uh, because again, a lot you know our tooling around a lot of these applications are not very good for detecting a offline model as whether or not it's going to be good. Ultimately, you you generally have to get it into production in, in order to really know and feel confident. Um, but but just like with this and just like with GitOps, um, you should absolutely you know you should commit into your repo. Say okay, I'd like to roll this thing out and I'd like to you know put one one thousandth of traffic against this. Uh, endpoint, and then you know you watch that endpoint and compare over time. Uh, and then when you're done with that, you go back to Git and say, okay, I'd like to ramp this up from one one thousandth to one percent, ten percent, and so on. Uh, I will be sharing all these slides. Um, MLOps in in Azure, obviously, we offer a number of services here and 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 solutions. And um, you know this is something that we care very deeply about, um, and and so on. Uh, Weaveworks is working on um, uh, an MLOps platform, but much of what you see here can already be achieved using something rich like a CICD solution like um, a WeFlux. Um, and what, what you would do is you would, you would use that as the backbone for driving your overall workload, and then you would call out to services such as the ones on Azure or Google or whatever it might be, AWS, that offer the particular components that you're looking for. For example, Azure has a data drift generator, which generates a set of model or a set of data that and schema that helps you understand if your data is drifting. And then we watch that for you. That's something you can just submit your model to us uh, and your data and we can create that for you. And then you can, can you know, take that back from uh, into uh, uh, WeFlux and, and move on to the next thing. Uh, what's next for MLOps? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that folks need to do, and this is not just on Azure, this is across the industry, uh, where we, we simplify that loop back from the end, from monitoring and retraining. Um, we, we need to do a lot of work uh, to extend MLOps into the data world. I described earlier about how you can make it easy to, or you can, you can do some work around your code to push training or uh, transformation code into Git, but I don't, I think there's even more that we could do, particularly around statistics generation and profiling and so on. Um, and then I think there's a lot of enterprise features that we have here. Uh, testing in ML is still quite weak across the industry. Um, you know, auditing, while it's very easy, obviously, to generate uh, SHAs and hashes about what you did, um, uh, actually, you know, offering that as a business solution to someone and making it very easy for a non-software engineer or dev to, you know, produce the results. You know, what did this customer actually see? Uh, Up-leveling our security, particularly with inbound data. I think that's something that's really important. And then the last one here is a really big effort of mine uh, that I think is, is absolutely critical. I think we need a lot more work around uh, metadata and API standards. Because unless you develop API standards and metadata around each of these steps, Every time you swap one solution for another, you have to rewrite everything from scratch, which is obviously not ideal. Um, if we can develop some standards, uh, a lot more stuff uh, is good. Okay, uh, or better yet, you tell us. Um, we, you know, ML is a um, super passionate um, uh, area. There's so much stuff going on right now. And, you know, it's really all about, um, 
you know, listening to the people out there and figuring out what we need to do in order to um, make things better. Okay. Uh, and I do like to end with this. If you are listening to this right now, you are part of the people who are, you know, setting the guidance for the future. You are helping give the subject matter experts the tools to make the world a better place. I know it's very tech bro to say that, but it's true. Um, the reality is, is that you're not going to understand, you know, hemocrit levels or blood pressures or anything like that for understanding whether or not a uh, person is sick, but you can give very rich tools to the nurses and doctors and medical professionals to make their job easier. And so, I, you know, as you go to sleep at night or as you sit down at your desk in the morning, do think about what you can do to make people's lives better um, when it comes to, uh, you know, using machine learning in interesting ways. And, and don't try and solve the problem yourself. Don't think that you're smart enough when it comes to housing policy or any domain expertise. It's much better to go and, and you know, talk to them and just give them the tools um, to be great. Um, and that's it for there. I have a quick question about point of view on Jupyter Notebooks debacle in the NL Ops scenario. Can you say more about um, what you think what is the Jupyter Notebooks debacle? Uh, make sure to share with everybody as well. Yeah, I will. Oh, I meant to the person in the chat. Well, so I'll just answer what I think is the thing while you're, you're typing. A lot of folks don't like Jupyter Notebooks because as artifacts, they're not particularly good as uh, uh, software development artifacts um, that you can often run into trouble the, the, when it comes to you know, executing single cells. Uh, you can have issues when it comes to uh, breaking them up into production ready or distributed ways and so on. And that's really well understood. That said, uh, when I go around to any of the major uh, you know, people doing ML today, Jupyter Notebooks end up being the artifact of choice because that's what the data scientists are using. So um, uh, yes, exactly. So uh, ML DevOps and ML engineers like to, uh, uh, you know, move things into production uh, Python with a version script and so on. Um, what you what you already mentioned is, I think, the solution that I've seen the most common. They use a tool um, to convert that notebook into something that is pure Python because Python is much more well understood when it comes to this. And ideally, it's broken up and broken down into the right solution. NB Dev is wonderful. I'm really excited for that project. If you're on Kubeflow, there's a solution for doing this as well, as well in a distributed containerized way called Kale, K-A-L-E, uh, which is really cool. Um, but yes, exactly what it is. And I think that I had this somewhere in my my code here, here we go. So this step right here, where you clean and minimize the code, that is often where you take a notebook that was checked in and you programmatically convert that notebook using things like decorators and um, uh, you know, other, other techniques. Uh, you break it down into individual Python scripts and, and those artifacts are the ones that actually move forward in the pipeline rather than a you know um, a monolithic um, uh, notebook. Make sense? Do check out NB Dev and Kale, K-A-L-E. Uh, both are really cool, and I think that's definitely the direction things are going. Uh, I have about uh, four minutes left. Any other yeah. questions? <laughs> we're pretty much at close. Did you have anything else you wanted to say with your last slide, David? You were kind of wrapping up, but I didn't know if you. Had no, I don't. Uh, you know, my I guess the net of the you know my take is. Um, please email me if you have questions, comments, points of view, features you want. Uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. We do have a number of, um, uh, I have an example uh, repo that shows you how to use Kubeflow and, and uh, MLOps. And that really is just an example uh, that's Azure MLOps. Um, uh, you know, that's just an example, but it shows you how to loosely couple a bunch of different steps together. And I hope it'll be inspirational. Uh, and then if you had any questions about uh, some of the uh, hosted services that I talked about from Azure earlier, uh, you can see them here. And again, those are totally neutral hosted services. If you have your entire pipeline on SageMaker 
or on GitHub or, or get, uh, Google Cloud or on-prem, and you're just like, oh, you know what? I'm going to leave everything here, but I want something to go off and mod profile my model. That is a single API call, and you can go do that. Or maybe you don't have a model registry that you particularly like. Great. You can store your model on our registry, and it's one command to download it and use it elsewhere. So again, we've very much taken this very neutral approach. We think our end-to-end -end pipeline is quite good. I don't want to you know, underplay it. But don't feel like, oh, you know what? If I, if I go down this Azure route, I have to tear, tear out uh, everything. OK. Uh, with that, three minutes left. Any other questions, comments? Thank you um, so much for the nice comments, everyone. Sure. While we're waiting, I will, um, if you just will stop your share and I will just do our closing slides. Um, as I mentioned, if this is your first time joining the Weave Online User Group, welcome and thanks for coming. Um, we, this is the last of our season. We'll be kicking off more later. Um, we have our own various um, workshops. Uh, we have Slack channels. Um, as I mentioned, our meetup group here is the single source of truth. It's the best place to have the calendar for future events. Um, so. If we have any others, we have um, one last question. We have two minutes left. So we'll take one last question asking about, what about inference platforms? Oh, sorry, uh, I, I can't see it. Oh, here, inference platforms. Um, so I think that um, uh, generally speaking, inference is the, um, uh, you know, it's either a very, very easy problem or a very, very hard one. Um, most folks that I've seen today uh, take a very neutral approach to this. And they're just like, well, you know what, I'm gonna throw my model in a container uh, and you know, put something like Flask in that container and then just serve it. And that's fine, that's a great solution for a lot of people. However, if you wanna do something more sophisticated, I do highly recommend a number of different open source platforms out there. Um, uh, NVIDIA has one called TensorRT. Uh, Microsoft has one around the Onyx framework called Onyx Runtime. Um, and, and then you can get into even richer ones. Uh, there's a company out of London uh, called Selden, uh, which is doing some amazing work um, where it's not just about, you know, your serving platform, but in fact, higher level constructs where you're starting to do things like multi-arm bandits and sharing between various, um, you know, existing models and comparison and things like that. So what I would say to you is probably, you know, first come up with your requirements, things like, well, we need to do Canary or we're gonna have six different models in production against this endpoint or whatever it might be. Um, do you need gRPC? Do you need REST? Do you need so on and so forth? Uh, and then, you know, use those to map back to which platform you ultimately choose. Uh, you know, it's not, the, I, I don't wanna underplay it, um, but, you know, once you get to the point of inference and you're sure that the model works, um, there are some very well-defined ways of rolling things out, thanks to all these things like cloud-native architecture. And you really don't want to reinvent the wheel. Just think of it as, you know, just like any other Go binary. How would you roll that out? What would you do to check it? And so on. Great. With that, we are at the absolute hard deadline of 60 minutes. So thank you, David. Thanks so much for joining and everybody here for your uh, great questions. I hope you guys have a great holiday. Thank you again. Thanks, all. We'll see you. See you next year. Bye. Bye.